Hello, my name is Janet Heischetter, and it's my honor to serve as the Executive Director of the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation and to welcome you to this webinar on Rapid Onset Dystonia Parkinsonism, or RP RDP. RDP is a rare form of dystonia that can come on quickly, and like so many other forms of dystonia, it changes lives significantly. Fortunately for us today, we have a fantastic group of speakers who will help us better understand RDP and help us learn more about their research into RDP. I am so proud to introduce our panel of speakers for the program today. Dr. Allison Bashir is Vice President for Health Sciences and Dean of the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences for the University of Buffalo. Leading with expertise and a commitment to inclusivity, inclusivity Dr. Bashir integrates education, research, and clinical programs across the university's schools of health sciences, the Jacobs School, dental medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and pharma pharmaceutical sciences, public health, and health professions, as well as programs among hospital and clinical affiliates. She is president of UBMD, the oversight organization of the school's faculty practice. Dr. Brashear is the trustee of the McKnight Brain Research Foundation. Her election to the Association of American Medical Colleges Council of Deans Administrative Board allows her to shape national strategies that impact the country's 158 medical schools. She is also a board member of the Western New York Women's Foundation. In her spare time, Dr. Brasier is the world's foremost authority on the clinical presentation of RDP, a disease she began studying as a resident at the Indiana University School of Medicine in 1991. Dr. Brashear obtained her medical degree and completed neurology residency at Indiana University School of Medicine. She also has an MBA from Duke University. I am also pleased to say that Dr. Brashear has served on the DMRF Medical and Scientific Advisory Council. Our next speaker will be Dr. Lori Azulius. Dr. Azulius is an Associate Investigator, Neurology Mass General Research Institute, and Associate Professor of Neurology at the Harvard School of Medicine, and associate member of the Broad Institute. Dr. Ozulius's research focuses on the genetics of movement disorders and in dystonia and Parkinson's disease in particular. Dr. Ozulius did her undergraduate studies at Brown University and received a PhD in genetics from Harvard Medical School in 1994. Her postdoctoral training was carried out in the laboratory of Xander Brakefield at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. In 1999, she took a position as an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and in 2007, moved to the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where she was an associate professor in the Departments of Genetics and Genomic Studies and Neurology, and held the Bachmann-Strauss Chair in Movement Disorders. In 2015, she moved back home to Massachusetts and joined the General, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital Harvard Medical School, where she is an associate geneticist, associate professor of neurology. Her research focuses on the genetics of movement disorders, as I said, and in particular in identifying genes for dystonia. Her lab has been uh, um, involved in the identification of DYT1, DYT6, DYT12, DYT25, DYT4, and DYT3. Her lab is currently working on defining the mutational and clinical spectrum associated with DIT12, dystonia, identifying modifier genes for DIT3 dystonia, and identifying other genes involved in the later onset focal forms of dystonia using whole exome and genome sequencing, as well as genome-wide association studies. I'm pleased to also say that Dr. Azulius has served on the DMRF board uh, Medical and Scientific Advisory Council. Dr. Kathleen Swedner is our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Swedner has a PhD in biochemistry from Harvard University and for postdoctoral training studied rat neurons in the cell culture at Harvard Medical School. She took a position as assistant professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Massachusetts General Hospital and is an associate professor there to this day. Her research is focused on the sodium-potassium ATPase, 
whose main genes are known as ATP1A1, ATP1A2, ATP1A3, and ATP1A4. She discovered the ATP1A3 as a graduate student and has studied many different features of it, including its activity, its expression in the nervous system, and its regulation by signaling pathway, and most recently, its, gene its genetics and how variants have pathological effects in cells. An important note for our dystonia advocates out there, Dr. Schwedner was one of the first investigators to receive funding from the Department of Defense Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, of which our advocates work so hard every year to create that, that opportunity for dystonia researchers. These three remarkable investigators have been working together for many years. Dr. Brashear and Dr. Rizulius began collaborating in 1991. Dr. Azulius first reported the gene causing RDP in 2004. Dr. Sweetner joined them in 2007, and their work on ATP1A3 has received continuous funding from the National Institutes of Health since 2008. They have defined and expanded the clinical phenotype, defined the non-motor manifestations of ATP1A3, reported on imaging, additional mutations in the gene, and uncovered some of the clues of how the mutations impact function of one of the most important proteins in neurons. We are so fortunate to have them um, here today to help us understand RDP, but also incredibly fortunate to have them working on this form of dystonia. So at this point, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Brasier. Dr. Brasier? Great. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm so honored to work with my colleagues, Dr. Schwedner and Dr. Ozelius, uh, for these many, many years. Uh, so um, can I have the first slide? Well, as you saw, we've been working together for, for many years, um, and it's really very exciting. Um, and uh, we've been able to really take a, a clinical problem and um, look at it both from a molecular basis, a genetic basis, and a clinical basis. It's been very rewarding. Next slide. So first and foremost, I want to just call out why we study rare diseases. And really, we believe, as does, I believe, the NIH, that it's important to study rare disease because they give a window into more common diseases. And so rapid onset dystonia Parkinsonism was named actually by Dr. Bill Dobbins, who saw the very first patient and first family, uh, because they clearly had dystonia, which is how uh, Dr. Ozelius got involved. And then they also had bradykinesia and balance instability, which is why they have the term Parkinson's. And as we begin to unpack what we've learned about this disease, you can see that by studying this particular disease would give you a window into other um, more common clinical syndromes, that being dystonia, that being Parkinson's, and that being other things that cause such as cognitive impairment, psychological issues. And so we believe uh, that studying a rare disease like this really can um, really unearth um, new findings about how the brain works. Next slide. So we also think that by really um, focusing on rare disease, you can get a shift, shifting landscape. And, and I think um, one of the important things is when you study a gene and then you study how that impacts so many symptoms, then you can begin to frame out how you might find a, a drug and then the treatment. And so one of the rare disease that did that was SMA, which now had several drugs in a disease that was uh, rare, but also um, had in, in absolute mortality. Um, and now those children are living into adulthood, which is in my lifetime, that's an incredible change. The picture here is hanging in my office. I can see it over the corner of my computer. And this was actually done by a young woman who grew up normally until she was in her 20s. And she had a, a severe psychological stressor and over a couple of weeks developed severe dystonic um, hands, inability to walk, difficulty with communication and difficulty swallowing. And I met her in um, on one of our trips to visit with patients and their families in another country. And um, she gave me this painting and it reminds me that what we are, we are doing is we're trying to really find treatments and, and preventions for um, really 
uh, impactful disabling diseases. So when she gave me this, she said the name of the painting is called Hope. And um, it was done by uh, this patient who had, as I said, very severe dystonic hands. And um, I just think it's a part that grounds us all that we do this all because we want to benefit patients. Next slide. So the story I'm going to share with you at the beginning, and then my colleagues will share um, their work and discoveries, is really began by listening to a patient and taking a very good history, listening with an open mind and realizing that what was before um, Dr. Dobbins was something that was highly unusual. Um, I will also say that individuals who had been affected with what we now call RDP were seen by a variety of different doctors. So the, there was a rich family history, uh, but being able to be open-minded and to take a, a good history, do a good physical exam is incredibly important. So as I talk to medical students in my role here at the University of Buffalo, I think it's really important to listen to patients. Um, and then you might actually uh, find a, a new disease. So next slide. So this is a um, pedigree from the first page publication in 1993. And as I say, a picture is a thousand words. And what was really happened is um, uh, two siblings, which I'll explain, came into the emergency room separated by a couple of weeks. And some Dr. Dobbins and others began to take a history and soon realized that this sudden onset over days to weeks to, uh, to months had occurred in several different family members. But only when someone took the time to really listen did you actually realize that there was more to the story than just someone developing an undiagnosed movement disorder or other problems that had been kind of written off as either encephalitis or behavior problems or uh, severe schizophrenia with movement disorders from medications or other things. And so putting the picture together is really important. And um, as a neurologist, we know to take a history, but making sure that you take a detailed family history. So what you see here is the um, the children and uh, one of the children in the black and white photo is actually the woman with the gray hair. And then she had her son who was affected. Um, and then she also had an unaffected son, an affected grandson. And so we learned a lot about um, this disease just from talking to this family. And then once we met this family, we began to meet other families. And we'll tell you more of that story. Next slide. So this is what we uh, the what pro band or this is the first affected individual, and I think I want to just give you a couple different clues that hopefully will trigger something when you when we go through the story. So she was um, said to have deafness from encephalitis, and I put that encephalitis in uh, air quotes. Um, then later, um, when she was in her teens, um, she actually went to the, uh, the school for the deaf where she was going to learn more about communication. Um, and you can see a picture of her. When her family dropped her off, she looked like the young woman there. And when they picked her back up a couple of weeks later, she was unable to stand independently, had difficulty with any type of speech and swallowing and had severe dystonic posturing in her hands. So she was brought to the emergency room and then later seen by um, my colleague, Dr. Dobbins. At the time, I was a resident. I was finishing the end of my residency. And Dr. Dobbins had taken, as we saw, a very good history. Um, I was um, uh, talking to him and he said, um, I'm leaving. I need you to take care of this family. And we think this might be a new, a new disease. And oh, by the way, I've been working with Dr. Xander Rakefield, who happened to have this amazing postdoc in her lab named Dr. Ozelius. So um, uh, this was the first patient. To make the story, um, she had a brother who was almost the same age, and he had a rather stressful event a couple of weeks later. Um, a reaction to a medication and also a significant amount of running, even though he was a cross country runner. And he developed almost similar dystonic uh, posturing and balance instabilities a couple of weeks later that came on over hours. And then, of course, the story unfolded when uh, uh, Dr. Dobbins took a history. 
So um, it's really been an absolute pleasure to get to know this family and many other families. And it's because of their story that we began to unpack. Not only was this a new disease um, that had not been identified, um, but also began to understand the science. Next slide. So this is what we know now. And I would like to paint the picture that um, atp 183 diseases are across a continuum. So um, in uh, 2004, we had collected samples um, uh, uh, from families all over the world. We had gone and seen multiple patients and we were collecting information um, about the families. Um, we collected blood and we had multiple different pedigrees. And Dr. Ozelius in 2004 and her, uh, her team uh, called me up and said, we found the gene. Um, so then as things began to unfold, um, other syndromes that were kind of like RDP, but had some other features such as Kapos came to light. Now, remember, I also told you that the proband had a hearing loss due to encephalitis. Subsequently, several other people in the RDP families have had hearing loss. So there's a little bit of overlap there. Then in the, uh, the mid 2000s, um, in two separate papers published on the same day, ATB1A3 was found to cause alternating hemiplegia of childhood. And alter hemiple alternating hemiplegia of childhood, or AHC, comes off before the 18 months of age and is um, really has significant abnormal movement disorders, um, lots of seizures, including status, and has episodes, sometimes up to 100 a day, of a hemiplegia where patients really cannot move at all. Um, and, they, and they do also have dystonic posturing. And then we have RICA, which has had some overlap, which comes on and with an encephalopathy. They have these features, again, that kind of overlap with CAPOs, overlap with RDP and AHC. So as you can see, through the years from 2004, um, until now, there has become a continuum of diseases, some that overlap and some that have symptoms that are separate, all attributable to mutations in ATP1A3 related diseases. Next slide. So today we're going to talk predominantly about RDP. And so what is RDP? It is um, rapid onset dystonia Parkinsonism. And this is a paper published by my colleague, um, Itcham Hawk, who is now the head of the movement disorder section at the University of Miami. At the time he was at Wake Forest when I was there. And um, we were able to use the detailed phenotyping that we had done in um, our research to show what were the symptoms at the region initial visit and what was where was what were the symptoms that were first felt. When we originally published RDP in the early 90s, we said that there was a rostral caudal gradient. In other words, that people had more speech problems than arm or leg. But as you can see in this study, we were able to discern that people don't necessarily have a rostral caudal gradient. And in fact, most people, when we went back, found that they had their first symptom in their arm. This and other work has really began to open the spectrum that what could possibly be RDP and ATB1A3 related diseases. And now over the course of time, almost monthly, we're getting patients identified who have a bit of this and a bit of that, but have an ATP1A3 mutation. And so one of the things we really have advocated through this paper and others is that if there is some form of dystonia involved, that it is worth testing for ATP1A3, because it very well could be part of the continuum of the diseases of ATP1A3 related diseases. Next slide. So here we've given a slide by a side by side, excuse me, comparison of RDP and AHC. So one of the really crystal clear ones is onset um, less than 18 months of age. Um, and then the other piece is both have triggers most of the time, but not all of the time. And so in RDP, the triggers were things like two identical twins, both having onset 
when they gave birth to children, extreme exercise, such as someone running a marathon, but had trained obviously for the marathon and developed symptoms after severe exercise, fever, psychological stress, and also alcohol, but not first time alcohol. AHC is brought on by stimuli and people can, uh, patients will get have multiple episodes, lots up to a hundred a day can be brought on by uh, fever, extreme uh, emotional stimuli. And uh, the uh, parents often talk about cold water. Um, they have similar symptoms and physiology. Um, and one of the things we're trying to understand is the course over time. Uh, and so both features can also have seizures, although the seizures are far worse and far more pronounced in AHC, some leading to status and significant uh, disability from that. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Ozelius, who's going to talk about the genetics and um, the work that she did with her colleagues uh, towards understanding um, how the genes um, interact in ATP1A3 related diseases. It's my pleasure to bring her onto the screen and I'm going to turn the presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Bashir. <clears throat> so this is just a um, cover of the paper um, where we identified the gene. So in 2004, as uh, Dr. Bashir has mentioned, we used that first large family plus a few other families to identify mutations in the ATP1A3 gene as causative for rapid onset dystonia Parkinsonism. Next slide. <clears throat> so I wanna take a little step back and try to explain a bit about um, different types of mutations or what mutations are. So we all know that DNA is made up of four letters, G, A, T, and C, and that these letters can combine in many different ways to form all the different proteins that we have in our body. And so the proteins are the molecules that do the work in our cells. And so uh, it turns out that there's different three letter combinations of DNA that code for amino acids. And amino acids are the building blocks of the proteins. <clears throat> so in this example, I basically have a sentence made up of three letter words. And so you can see the top sentence says, Tom, get the pen. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you make a single change, so this would be like making a single change in your DNA, it can result in changing the, the meaning or uh, making the meaning um, unintelligible of the sentence. And so you can see if we make a single substitution in the first example, instead of Tom get the pen, we have Tom get the P. We switch the N for an A. And so that kind of mutation is called a missense mutation. In the second sentence down, or the third sentence down, we now switch the E in the with an O. And now we get a sentence that doesn't make sense. Tom get the P. So that's what we call a nonsense mutation. And then in the fourth um, row down and the sixth row down, we have two different kinds of uh, changes. One is a deletion and one is an insertion. So in the fourth row down, all we've done is delete the E from get. And you can see when you delete a letter that shifts all the other letters over. And the first word is still fine, but all the le uh, words after that are no longer intelligible. And the same thing happens in the sixth row down when you in actually insert a letter. So we've inserted an S between the TH of the, and you can see again, the first two words are fine, but once you make that insertion, it shifts the frame and the rest of the sentence is no longer understandable. And so those kind of mutations are called frame shift mutations. So those are the basic kind of mutations that uh, you can find when you're looking at a disease, um, at least some of them. The next slide, please. So this is just a schematic at the bottom, it shows you the gene for ATP1A3 and the uh, vertical bars are what we call exons or the coding bits of the gene. And those coding bits come together in the middleman, the mRNA. And then the mRNA is the thing that uh, encodes for the um, amino acids, those three bases that we were just talking about. And that then in turn makes the protein, which is at the top. And 
you can see that this protein is just a 2D structure and the little dots and stuff above the protein are all the mutations, or at least some of the mutations that are known in ATP1A3 to cause disease or do things that we don't know exactly what they are yet. And so the, the red uh, dots are AHC mutations and the blue dots are RDP mutations. And the green dots are those ones that we don't know exactly whether they cause disease or not. So they could just be a variant. Um, you know, we all have different variations in our genome that don't necessarily cause anything. So it could be one of those, or it could be something that we don't understand yet. So another thing to notice about this is that the mutations aren't distributed evenly across the whole protein, that they actually are in clusters. And you can also see that those clusters, so there's a, a little coloring up on the side, a little key that tells you the difference between the dark gray, the light gray, and the kind of clear or white. And those are the different parts of the protein. So extracellular means the protein is uh, outside of the cell. In, uh, cytoplasmic means it's inside of the cell. And transmembrane means it's across the membrane or the middle of the cell. I mean, the middle of the membrane that's surrounding the cell. And so you can see immediately that these clusters are in either the extracellular or the transmembrane domains of this protein. Um, can we go to the next slide? So I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, how this disorder could be inherited. And so this is showing you um, a pedigree where the squares are male and the circles are female. And the people who are colored in are affected with a disease. And so the first thing we have to remember from our you know, basic biology is that we all have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We get one set from our mom and one set from our dad. So we have two copies of any gene or marker or piece of DNA. And so dominant inheritance means that if you have one bad copy that you can get the disease. And so you can see in this pedigree that an affected person usually has an affected parent. So you see affected people in each generation. And the thing to remember about dominant inheritance is that each child of an affected person has a 50% chance of being affected. So it's not that 50% of the children in a family are gonna be affected, it's that each person has a 50% chance of being affected. So the next slide, showing us another way that a disease can be inherited. And so in this case, the mutation or the variant is arriving is arising de novo, which means new in the child that's colored in, in the picture. And so this means that neither parent has that variant. And so because neither parent has that variant, they're very unlikely to have another child with the same disorder. So this is really quite a difference between these two models in terms of reproductive choices. And so it's probably imperative to find out if you have a dominant inheritance or if you have a de novo inheritance, if you're thinking about having more children. Um, the next slide. So how do we go about getting genetic testing? So the first thing uh, is that most of the time the genetic testing is ordered by your clinician or maybe sometimes a genetic counselor. So after you have your test order, I mean, after you decide that you wanna have genetic testing, you need to then decide what kind of test. So your clinician or your genetic counselor can help you with this, of course. And this is just listing the three different kinds of tests you might be able to get. So one is a gene panel test. So here I'm talking about dystonia. So it's a dystonia gene panel. But if you had symptoms of epilepsy, there's an epilepsy gene panel. If you have symptoms of Parkinson's disease, there's a Parkinson's gene panel. If you have ataxia, there's an ataxia panel. And there are different, potentially different genes on these different panels. And so underneath are a couple of companies that um, do genetic testing. And you can see in the parentheses that they actually have different amounts of genes on their panels. And so you have to sort of look at, you know, think about what your symptoms are with your clinician, of course, think about what your symptoms are and then ask if the genes that you're interested in potentially 
testing because they you might have a mutation in them or your child might have a mutation in them, is it represented on this panel? The second thing is whole, called whole exome sequencing. And so when we were looking at that picture of the ATP1A3 gene, RNA, and protein, I told you about those little vertical bars that I called exons. So those are the coding bits. So whole exome sequence is basically sequencing the coding bits, those exons from the genome. And then whole genome, of course, is sequencing everything. So the next slide, trying to look at this a little bit to contrast the methods. So whole genome is, you know, our, our genome is 3 billion base pairs long. And so whole genome is basically sequencing all those 3 billion base pairs. So of course, this is the most expensive thing that you can do in terms of sequencing. And it's also difficult to analyze and interpret and you get a whole boatload of data. And so that's hard to store as well. And so, um, you know, eventually as the price of sequencing comes down, we'll probably be moving to whole genome sequence. But a lot of times we don't use that as the primary test right now. So the middle one is whole exome sequencing. And so now you're just sequencing, as I said, the coding bits, and that's about 30 million base pairs. So you can see from 3 billion, you're down to 30 million. So it's quite a step down. And this is a little less expensive and it's still kind of hard to analyze, but because most of the variants occur within a gene, it makes it a little bit easier to interpret, hopefully. And then the last one is that panel testing that I told you about. And you know how much is covered depends on how many genes you're looking at. And of course, this is the least expensive, it's the easiest and it's fastest and, um, and it's the easiest to analyze. Um, so the next slide, please. So now you've gone and done your genetic testing and you get your results back. So what can happen when you get your results back? So one thing that can happen is that you have a negative result. And so how do we interpret a negative result? One way to interpret it is that maybe what you have isn't genetic after all, but there's other ways to interpret it as well. So one way is that possibly, um, the mutation type that you have is not detected by the test. So the tests that I just described use what's called next generation sequencing. And that basically only sequences about 150 base pairs um, at a time. And it just does a whole, you know, it sequences the same 150 base pairs like 20 times or 100 times or whatever it is. And it tiles across you know, the regions that it's interested in that we're trying to sequence, either the whole genome or the exons. And so you don't, um, there's some kinds of mutations. So if you have a mutation that is a deletion that, you know, is larger than 150 bases, then you're not going to be able to see that. All right. And there's other kinds of mutations that are called like repeat expansion mutations. These cause a lot of the ataxias, Huntington's disease, uh, form of ALS, frontal temporal dementia, and these are just um, large repeats that, again, um, they're hard to capture in 150 base pair increments. And so those kind of mutations you would not um, see. The last, the third possibility is that you possibly have a mutation in uh, an untested or an undiscovered gene. So, you know, if you're using a gene panel, if your gene is not on that panel, you're not going to find that mutation. And if you are, have a mutation that's in a gene that nobody knows about yet, um, then it takes a little bit more than just seeing that you have a mutation in that to really prove that that mutation is causative of your disease. So the next slide. So the other thing that you can get on your genetic test is something called a variant of unknown significance or VUS. And so you can see that little bottom piece of the slide where it says results. This is actually results from someone's genetic test of ATP1A3. And you can see that they have, uh, the genotype says it's heterozygous, which means it's in one copy of the two. And it says it's de novo, which means it's new in that person. And then it tells you what the alteration is, it changes uh, the amino acid N to the amino acid H at that particular position, but we don't know how to interpret that because we've never seen it before. So we don't know whether that uh, is actually disease causing or if it's just one of the variants that 
um, we have normally in our genome. So each of us has about 2 million variants in our genome that don't necessarily cause any disease. And so ways that you can try to figure out if this is causative or not causative. Um, so that's what the first thing says, is it a pathogenic mutation, a causative mutation versus just a polymorphism, just a variation. Um, so one way you can look, try to uh, understand this is to look at the effect of the protein and to look at the function. And so Dr. Swedner is gonna go into more details about this in the next part of the talk. Um, you can also ask if there, if this variant is seen in the population. So, you know, there's a lot of control population databases out there with um, tons of information uh, from people that have been sequenced before. And so you can look into those databases and you can ask, has this variant, this N321H ever been seen in any of those control databases? And if you think it's a causative mutation, then it should not be seen a lot you know, like if it's seen a hundred times in the database, it's probably not a causative mutation. But if it's maybe seen once or twice, it could be a causative mutation. So it's just another piece of evidence. And then the last thing is, you know, when you go to your clinician or your genetic counselor and you're trying to get, you know, they're, they're gonna give you your results now and they come back with this result, BUS, it's very challenging them, for them to try to relay what this means to you. And so, because basically it means we don't know what it means. <laughs> and so um, I'm gonna now um, pass this over to uh, Dr. Swedner, who's gonna talk about the function of this protein encoded by ATP1A3 gene, and also about how, to, how understanding the function might be able to help us resolve whether a VUS is causative or not. Okay, thank you very much. Next slide. Um, Many genes for dystonia, you know, when they were first found, people had no idea what they did. And so it's followed by decades of research to even start understanding how it causes disease. But that's not true for ATP1A3. We know exactly what it does. It was actually discovered in the 1950s as an ion pump. So it's a membrane protein. This is a lipid bilayer. And it hydrolyzes ATP as the energy unit of the cell in order to force the transport of potassium sodium ions, which are shown here as green, out of the cell, and then allow potassium ions, which are purple here, into the cell. So this creates a gradient of um, concentrations of charged ions across the membrane, and it makes all of the activity of the brain, the electrical activity of neurons talking to each other. It makes that all possible. This particular ATPase, the A3 one, also um, modulates synaptic activity. So it's quite important for almost everything that the brain does. Now, the, there are three different versions, A1, A2, and A3. And the A3 one is specialized for neurons. It's, it's the expressed only in neurons in the brain. And it's usually in active neurons and especially in inhibitory neurons. So if you damage activity in inhibitory neurons and you don't have enough inhibition, you can get too much neural activity. And as people familiar with dystonia, you probably know that it's been thought for a long time that there is, uh, dystonia is essentially a problem of overflow of activation so that you get too much activation of muscles. Um, instead of just the right amount. Next slide, please. So we do know a lot about this sodium potassium ATPase, ATP1A3, and there are even um, crystal structures that we can use for modeling the variants to see where they are and how they're involved in the protein's function. On the left, you see a ribbon diagram of the structure of the um, protein. And there are the um, bright pink dots in the middle, just above the top arrow, arrow, are potassium ions that are bound right in the ion binding site in the middle of the membrane. The membrane domain is the white part of the protein. Then the purple blobs are five different AHC mutations, the alternating hemiplegic childhood. Um, 
they are all clustered in one place, which is interesting. There are also other examples, like there's um, an, a, a, an individual who has an RDP mutation where it's right at the active site that hydrolyzes ATP. And that's in the red part of the protein, not in the membrane, but in a different location. And it's been known for many years that anytime you meet it at residue, you inactivate the enzyme completely. So there's, it's understood that that is disease causing or pathogenic. Now, if you look on the right-hand side on the gray boxes, um, on the left are ATP1A3 mutations that produce mild phenotypes in the membrane domain. And you can see those two potassium ions in the center the mutations surround them, but they're not close. On the right-hand side, you have severe phenotypes, and there the mutations are clustered right around the ions. If you rotated that around, you couldn't see the ions at all because they're covered with individual mutations. Now, each, each person only has one of those mutations, of course. Next slide, please. All right. so. How do we understand how it causes disease? So, of course, if you lose the gene completely, it's not expressed at all or it's deleted, um, then you only have one good copy of a dominant disease, and that may not be enough. So that's one way to do it. But supposing that the protein is made, there are two different ways that you can get disease. One is that it just doesn't function right, and that could mean that it's completely inactive or that its affinity for ions has become low. So it can't load up as many ions. It can't pump as fast as it should be. So that's a, a functional mutation. But the other kind of, of way that you can get dominant disease is if the change in the gene actually prevents the protein from folding properly. So if you look at the yellow diagram on the left, the um, Proteins are made in the ER, which is uh, endoplasmic reticulum, which is the folded stuff on the left-hand side. And when it's made, it comes out of the ribosome as just a linear protein that hasn't folded at all. And it has to spontaneously fold. It has to fold itself by its own internal rules with the help of some proteins called chaperones. If the variant prevents one of those steps in folding because it's too bulky, for example, or because it no longer fits and you can't make a certain kind of turn, then you get what's called a misfolded protein. And you can see one there in the middle of the slide. Um, it's just not folded the way it should be on the right-hand side of the slide. So those proteins, um, the cell will try to refold them. It slows down biosynthesis, but sometimes it succeeds and you get a little bit of the protein. And if you can help that process, you might be able to improve the symptoms in the disease by improving the amount of protein that gets to the membrane. But another thing that can happen is misfolded proteins can aggregate. And when that happens, well, that produces disease like Alzheimer's disease. You've probably heard of that being a problem of uh, different proteins that aggregate in the brain. And it, that makes it very difficult for cells and often kills the cells. So what can we do about it in the lab? Um, can you show the next slide, please? What we've been able to do is to make cell lines which replicate the disease um, without, actually, we don't need anything from the patients. We only need to know the DNA sequence. So we can introduce the mutation into a small piece of DNA called a plasmid. And then we can integrate the plasmid in the second step into a human cell line that has a recombination site built into it. So what happens then is you can get a whole series of cell lines. Um, some of them have the normal gene in them, and the others each have a different variant so that you compare different variants to each other. And you could see how they differ from each other. And that's really important for a disease like this, whereas Dr. Bashir showed you there's so many different manifestations that oftentimes come from completely different variants. So we want to compare those variants side by side. In element number three down there, you can see that you can determine whether or not the protein is made and how well it's made. 
In this case, the wild type has the normal amount of protein, and these two different variants, G358 and I363, they, have, they make less of the protein, I63 even less than the G358 one. So we know that there's something wrong with biosynthesis in that case. And in panel number four, um, we can ask whether it has activity. Um, and the simplest way is we can do experiments where we expect the new protein that we put in there to support the life of the cell. If it has enough activity to support life, which requires maybe 20% of the normal amount of activity, then the cells look fine as they do on the left. If it doesn't have enough activity, then the cells die and they end up with these little crumpled balls as you can see on the right. So that's uh, laboratory evidence that it's pathogenic, that it actually causes disease. Now the next slide, please. So um, we know that, um, that if you have multiple people with the same variant that have very similar symptoms, that's the strongest evidence that something is pathogenic. And, and that is true for RDP, for all of the major variants that L, Dr. Bashir um, introduced. Um, they all have multiple people with the same. And if you have a VUS where you're the only person that has it or it really isn't clear whether it's causative or not, laboratory experiments can show whether it's impaired or not. Another thing that you can do that is predictive is that you can look in the structure to see if it's in a place in the structure that is known to be very important for the protein. And if, if it is, then you can say that it is probably pathogenic, probably disease causing. If it's actually at the edge of the protein where oftentimes substitutions are tolerated, then you don't learn anything new, and, and that variant remains a VUS, a variant of un, uncertain significance. But then there are also relatives, like um, the sodium potassium ATPase is not the only ion moving ATPase. There are quite a bit of them, it's a big family. And here's an example where there's a calcium ATPase, completely different protein, only 30% identical to the sodium potassium ATPase. But in this particular residue that's shown over here in the diagram on the right, the arginine R R750 and R756, the same mutation, the same residue gets mutated in both of these proteins. And in both cases, it causes disease. So even if this was a VUS for the sodium potassium ATPase, if it's known to be disease causative in a calcium ATPase, we would then, I mean, at least the basic scientists would say it must be path pathogenic. Now, can we learn more? That's the most important thing. So what we've learned from doing these kinds of mutations so far and studying them in the lab is that most of the RDP mutations that we've studied affect the function of the protein. Most of the mutations that cause really, really severe infant um, variants, um, the most severe kind that weren't even on the diagram that she showed, those affect protein folding. And for intermediate phenotypes, there can be a mixture of um, affecting function and affecting folding. And then the, there are several variants which are actually triggered by fevers. And they usually show up in children when they have ordinary childhood diseases that trigger a fever. We studied one of those in depth, and we found out that it's literally temperature sensitive in the range of normal human fevers. So that when you express it in a cell, if you raise the cells to a febrile temperature, um, the protein falls apart. So we know that it's pathogenic, not because it's affected its protein or it's affected its folding, but because it's vulnerable to, it's become temperature sensitive. So the important thing to take home from this is that those different groups of, me of mechanisms require different approaches. If you're thinking about therapy, um, something that is affecting the symptoms, you're probably going to want to look for a drug that can compensate for the effect of the importance of uh, the impairment of function. 
for something that affects protein folding, you're going to want to look for a drug that affects protein folding, as people are doing for cystic fibrosis. And if it's fever-induced, then you're going to want to talk to your doctor about controlling and, and preventing fevers. So that really sums up what we can do for in the lab for um, understanding the ATP1A3 variants. And I'd like to pass it back to Dr. Bashir. Thank you so much to Dr. Sweder and Dr. Zelius. Um, this has been really a terrific overview. Can I have the next slide? So um, uh, we wanted to just share a little bit about the work that we've been doing since, as we said, 2008 um, together. Um, and we have had uh, NIH funding to really explore both the uh, the signs and symptoms of um, AD1A3 related diseases, the genetics, understanding um, how the structure impacts the function um, of the protein. And this is how many people we have enrolled over the different time periods. We are still enrolling in cycle three and we are doing all of it via telemedicine, including um, uh, memory uh, testing and neurologic exams. And it's uh, really been um, uh, so gratifying to work with families and individuals who don't have a family history uh, that have uh, uh, these mutations in their families because in that way we learn more and more about how uh, disease is caused, particularly in people who have new mutations. Uh, so we are very interested in meeting any individuals who may have uh, symptoms of rapid onset dystonia Parkinsonism. And we're incredibly grateful to the NIH for their continuous funding. Next slide. So as you've learned, because we are a team and we are doing um, really interdisciplinary science, both from taking histories and physicals, the genetics, um, how the protein and the mutations interact, um, this actually combines together so that we can begin to understand how there's potential treatments uh, or prevention, and also how learning about this rare disease, as we mentioned in the beginning, actually informs more common diseases such as dystonia, Parkinsonism, um, me uh, memory problems, and um, other things that go along with some of the AT1A3 related diseases. Um, I also want to give a big shout out to Rebecca Firth, who's the study coordinator and project manager for this um, uh, multi-site study, uh, and Dr. Eleonora Napoli, who also works uh, on this uh, study. Um, you can get more information about this research at the email atb1a3research at buffalo.edu. The phone number, we have a website, and then we also have a Facebook page. And we really encourage people to join the Facebook page. Um, it really provides a lot of information. And if you have your phone handy, you can also look at this QRS code and see a video about the research and what we're doing to learn more about AT1A3 and how it contributes to, to learning more about more common diseases. So with that, um, I think we're gonna open this for questions and can I have, um, I think we're, we don't have any more slides. Uh, I think that's right. And that's, I think it's time uh, for our first questions. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, wonderful overview. Thank you all uh, for the presentation, for the information, and again, um, for your work. Um, I, I just wanna note, um, Dr. Brashear, I think it was fitting to share with us that painting from your patient um, and what a beautiful title, hope, because that's really that's really what research is all about, right? Really um, helping uh, give patients hope, and and um, and I think the information you shared today is certainly in in keeping with that that patient's desire. So thank you all. Uh, for, we had a number of, of questions from um, our community, and so I want to thank those people who offered them. Um, the first one is: Is there new research in RDP, um, and will this lead to treatment. Um, Dr. Dr. Sweetner, I'll, I'll give that one to you. You touched on it a little bit, but could you um, respond to that question? Yeah. Um, there are no drugs in the pipeline now. And one of the um, things that makes finding drugs a little bit difficult 
is the the range of the symptoms mm -hmm. that that people have. Um, dystonia is definitely the major problem with rapid onset dystonia Parkinsonism, but it also shows up in almost all of the other um, ATP one A three syndromes. And as you know, there are, there are a handful of drugs that help and DBS is a possibility. Um, DBS has been actually tried in a couple of RDP patients without success, but there was a recent report of putting a DBS electrode in a different part of the brain. So I think that there's a lot of um, hope that um, that is something that could be pursued in the future. For alternating hemiplegia of, of childhood, um, there's a drug that actually helps that is an old, um, used to be used for epilepsy, but has been um, superseded by better drugs, um, but really helps the children that have the alternating hem hemiplegia of childhood, or at least, at least a large fraction of them, certainly not all. But what's most needed, I think, for making progress in drugs is developing um, communities of people that are ready for a trial, a clinical trial. And that's where the work of Dr. Bashir and Bashir in this um, program come in because um, with rare diseases, um, you need to not only, you need to be able to do trials of um, people that are based primarily on their phenotypes so that you can um, track any change in their phenotypes over time. And that's why the um, foundations like um, DMRF are so important for getting people together, getting them to be knowledgeable and getting them to be willing to participate in trials when trials become available. And finally, I should mention that um, there are a couple of laboratories working on other approaches to therapies. Uh, there's some working on gene therapy and that's still a long way from being successful, but they're working on it. And they're also working on um, a therapy called ASOs, which is a kind of mRNA, mRNA therapy that sometimes helps with other rare diseases. So research is um, definitely on the horizon and um, the support that people get from foundations is absolutely critical for um, getting new ideas off the ground. Yeah, thank you for that. I, uh, and I appreciate Dr. Prashir sharing that information on how families can, can get connected with the work that you're all doing. Um, and we can put that slide up again at the end um, uh, to help people just in case they, they didn't catch it. And um, if anyone's watching this recording, you can always contact the, the DMRF and we'll make sure that we get you directed there too, because participation in those studies are so, is so critical, right? So. Um, thank you for that, and thank you for that um, response, Dr. Sweetner. Um, uh, Dr. Brashear, how many people are affected by RDP? We probably several hundred uh, across the world. I will just say, though, that um, probably every month we have people who have a piece of the RDP phenotype who get gene tested and then are contacting us. So um, we've been able to do detailed um, uh, clinical evaluations on about Oh, 75 to 100 people over the course of many years, including detailed neurologic exams. But I believe that all atp one a 3 related diseases are underreported uh, mm -hmm. because it takes someone to think about this is a possibility to or or somebody who goes off against uh, their all their genome screen. So I do think that it's really important to see a neurologist who has uh, movement disorders expertise to be able to think about that. Um, when I first met Dr. Huck a long time ago, he was a new faculty member and um, he sent off a whole bunch of gene tests on a patient that had a bits and pieces of a little bit of dystonia and a little bit of this and that. And he stopped me in the hall and said, I guess I need to talk to you because I sent off a gene panel and this patient has ATP1A3. And so um, that was the beginning of our collaboration when he and I were both at Wake Forest. So yeah. the answer is probably more people than we know of. Yeah. It, do, is there a registry for ATP183 uh, or any of the ATPAs? No. 
No, not to my knowledge. Um, we have probably the largest cohort in the world of patients with RDP. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Zulius, is genetic testing um, for RDP commercially available? And, and how would somebody go about getting genetically tested? So I talked a little bit about this already, but <clears throat> yeah, basically um, RDP or, a or ATP 1A3 disorders, AHC, you can uh, get testing using a gene panel. And so if depends on what your symptoms are, if your symptoms are dystonia like, then you would, you know, ATP 1A3 will be on a dystonia panel. If your symptoms, you know, have something to do with epilepsy, ATP 1A3 is also on the epilepsy panel. So ATP 1A3 crosses multiple of those gene panels, but you can also get um, whole exome sequencing where you will obviously also test ATP 1A3 as one of the many genes that are in our genome. Um, as I said before, also, you know, the best way to go about getting testing is to talk to your clinician about it. And um, they can, you know, tell you about the ins and outs of how to get it done. And, you know, they may have an associated genetic counselor that can talk to you about what it means to get tested. And if you get a result, what those results mean, how to interpret them, things like that. You know, that's what a genetic counselor is really good for. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's usually a pretty good idea to, before you decide to get a test, to talk to somebody about the implications of the test. And then after you get a test, you know, talk to them again so that you're, you know, getting um, all the information that you need to make good informed choices. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think, thank you for mentioning genetic counselors. I, I think we, they play such a critical role um, in helping people understand. Um, and sometimes I think um, we don't give them the credit that they're due, right? So I thank you very much for, for um, saying that. Um, Dr. Persher, what, what are the treatments for RDP right now? So the treatments are really symptomatic. So for example, the dystonic spasms antidotally respond well to benzodiazepines, particularly high doses. Seizures are treated generally with the usual anticonvulsants. Um, some patients respond to uh, trihexafenadol. Most patients do not respond to L-dopa or dopamine agonists, although there are some who have some mild response. There have been really no large clinical trials looking at any of these um, medications. And so everything I just listed is really just experience. Um, there are no medications that prevent um, the onset. So if someone knows they have the gene, what we typically say is that, you know, to avoid intensive exercise, um, fevers, um, you know, excessive alcohol, those are the things that we know are triggers. Uh, but that's really hard to do. And one of the things we also know is that, you know, people grow up and, you know, um, some people uh, don't, they may have that, what I just listed, and then they may not develop it. And then they go off and, and then develop it like the gentleman who trained for a very well-known marathon and then had no symptoms until he finished the marathon. So, but we are hoping that we will learn more, particularly with Dr. Swedner's and Dr. Ozelius's work about potential um, drugs that could prevent or treat. That's our goal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there a role for nutrition in mitigating symptoms? So, you know, in the patients who have epilepsy, the ketogenic diet has been discussed and um, postulated as a potential uh, therapeutic treatment, but to my knowledge, none of that's been done in a large trial or study. Again, in the true ketogenic diet is also, you know, at, difficult to continue to follow for a long time. And there's no evidence to show that anything like that, you know, is going to do anything but help the seizures. So it's, again, not been studied in any large trial. Yeah, yeah. We get the question about nutrition a lot. So, you know, it's a good one, right? I mean, people should pay attention to their nutrition just generally speaking, but yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, nutrition is one of those things that we're beginning to unpack more and more. And of course, um, people are looking at food as medicine. That's a big, a big phraseology that we use um, often. And understanding really what that means is, mm -hmm. is um, much more difficult but uh, certainly 
those things need to be explored. Yeah, yeah, for thank you. Medicine in general. For sure, thank you, thank you. Dr. Julius, you touched on this a little bit, but we had a question about um, whether or not RDP skips generations. Can you just review that again briefly? So RDP can be uh, inherited as a dominant disease or it can be inherited de novo. So if it's inherited de novo, as I said, the chances, you know, that means that neither parent has the mutation and therefore the chances of them having another child uh, with the disease is very low. So dominant inheritance, I didn't give you the complicated version of dominant inheritance. <laughs> so there's a thing called reduced penetrance, which means you can have the mutation, but you don't express the clinical symptoms. So for instance, DYT1 dystonia has about a 30% penetrance, which means that's 70% uh, of the time a person will have the mutation, but they won't have any of the clinical symptoms. So in RDP, there's a little evidence for reduced penetrance. And so there is the possibility that an affected, uh, that, a, that the disease could skip a generation because of reduced penetrance. But if you, if the disease is inherited as a dominant in your family, it's not de novo, then most likely you'll see an affected person in every generation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brashear, a question for you again. Um, and Dr. Senior talked about this a little bit, but if DBS works for dystonia sometimes, and we know it does well for like DYT1 um, and Parkinson's disease, will it work for RDP? So there's been no large study in DBS and RDP. There have been patients who have been treated, and there are some reports in the literature about either um, you know, different locations for the stimulator. And generally those patients have not gotten any benefit. Um, they're, you know, and they've been done in different countries. It's not known exactly the technique of the electrode placement, et cetera. So as we also know with DBS, sometimes it depends on the team and, you know, where it's, where the electrodes are placed. And then of course the programming. So there is no report of any patient that I know that's had a dramatic benefit from a deep brain stimulator. One of the things to think about is um, in what stage that patient would be getting either stimulator or any other treatment, uh, because we have some patho uh, human pathology that's been published that shows that there's a significant cell dropout in patients who um, passed away in their 80s who had RDP. And so again, um, there's no evidence to show that the stimulators help, but it's only been done in one-off cases in with individual providers, individual patients, uh, a couple in the US, a couple outside the country. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Swedner, you talked about this a little bit as well, but I want to make sure this person's question gets specifically answered. Where do we stand with drug discovery? Um, and they also added prevention to that. Well, I don't think that there are any ongoing trials. Um, right. There's, uh, in terms of which drugs are prescribed, it's going to depend mainly on the patient's manifestations. So um, I can't tell you anything. There, there have been, uh, there are some mouse studies going on now, um, but they deal with mice that have alternating hemiplegia of childhood mutations, which are a little bit more severe. And even those are not actually uh, screening drugs. It's it's quite difficult. I think one, one of the issues with ATP1A3 is that it's expressed in all the neurons and yet all the neurons do so many different things that it's a little bit hard to guess what what is going to be helpful. The benzodiazepines that Dr. Brashear brought up are known to be inhibitory, and they do help the patients that that have very severe dystonia. So that is that that's a fallback, but it's it's not easy taking benzodiazepines. No. Yeah. Yeah. So more more research obviously needed um, to get us to that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Brashear, um, what do we know about the relationship between RDP and depression and anxiety? Are they related? 
Um, <clears throat> patients who have RDP may have um, cognitive impairment and psychological um, issues. Um, and we've been able to show that some patients have uh, psychosis. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I, the answer is probably we don't know the extent yet, but we will say, I will say that RDP is a brain disease. It is not just a motor disease. And much like the other dystonias that have been studied, we know now that patients with RDP do have motor symptoms, um, but they also have um, often uh, psychological issues um, uh, such as depression, anxiety, um, psychosis, the cognitive impairment, some have epilepsy, some have a pretty significant headaches, but um, I think that's the important part is this is not just a motor problem. There are lots of non-motor symptoms that are associated with RDP. Yeah, yeah. And and, and what other are, are those non-motor symptoms? I mean, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? So the non-motor symptoms would be what I just mentioned, um, uh, you know, psychological issues, cognitive impairment, um, of course, there's the paroxysmal form, which is as primarily epilepsy. Um, and I think those are the the real significant ones that um, patients also. We published a case of a patient who had a mutation and had significant cerebellar atrophy on MRI, which is atypical for most of the RDP patients, and had and that patient had pretty much isolated ataxia, um, and so uh, I think. It goes back to the, if you think about it, it's possible and you should test for it. And I think that's the way we're going to continue to broaden the continuum. When we first published the very first case um, with Dr. Dobbins, um, it was in 1993. Subsequently, all these phenotypes that were in the circles have come out and even more have come out that are, you know, a few, few individuals. And so I think the really message back is if you think about it, test for it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Zulius. Who who diagnosed this? With? <clears throat> so, you know, I think with any kinds of dystonias, people probably go to their neurologist first, right? Mm -hmm. And if they don't have a lot of experience with movement disorders, they probably send them to a movement disorder specialist. But again, it depends with these ATP one A three diseases when the person's getting it. So you might be going to a pediatrician or, you know, and then going to a pediatric neurologist or, you know, if, if the primary symptom is headaches, somebody might end up with a headache doctor, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's, it really depends on what the symptoms are. And, but I think ultimately because a lot of the symptoms are related to movement disorder, probably a movement disorder doc would be the person that would ultimately be trying to figure out what this is and potentially ordering tests, you know, cause I think they would know obviously more about dystonia and Parkinsonism and mm -hmm. what is the possibilities. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Bashir, is, is there any um, data regarding RDP and autoimmune disorders? Um, are people with RDP prone to any autoimmune, autoimmune diseases? No, there, there, we don't have any information, although we haven't done detailed testing to look up for autoimmune disorders. So that, that, but there, to date, there's no tie into autoimmune disorders. There is a, um, what we would call phenocopy that was published, but it, the person did not have at one 3 mutation. So um, we don't have any evidence right now to show that there is an autoimmune or inflammatory process with RDP. Um, but you know, that's, we continue to keep those things in mind as we learn more. Yeah, thank you. And our final question, Dr. Sweetner, this goes to you. How can model systems help to understand and lead us to treatment? You've touched upon some of this, but. Yes, um, I think for dystonia in general, there needs to be more model research. Um, there's, I think the field was dominated for a long time by the idea that it's a disease of basal ganglia, but it's actually, you know, it's the spinal cord that actually executes the dystonia. That's where the muscles get activated 
And there's been very little research about that in dystonia. Um, I think that mouse work with mouse mutants and also primate um, studies are very important. And I would encourage more of funding more electrophysiology, people who study mm -hmm. circuits to understand it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, this was really terrific. We are so grateful to all of you for your time and um, for the information you shared for, with us. Um, again, thank you for your work too. We appreciate it very much. Thank Thanks you. for hosting thank us. You. Thank you for inviting us. We're really pleased. Our pleasure.